like is it ledger cast thing it's not friday is it no i'm just i like to record things so i might as well you know so <laughs> this is now streaming on twitch and recording to video and recording to audio and i'll give you all the formats if people care oh i'll have to be careful then in what i say see that's the thing about spaces the fact that it's ephemeral turn, people i can turn them off <laughs> no it's fine i don't mind either way look it's fine uh it's just people ask about like replays of spaces and stuff and i think one of the good things about the format is the guests tend to be much more uh kind of you know loose lips mm. because they're comfortable with the fact that it's got this like ephemeral nature to it and you come and it disappears like it never happened, you know? So, so they, they tend to be a bit more forthcoming with the alpha leaks as opposed to this, um, the, the full podcast pre-recording. I, ca I, you know I carry I mean. no alpha anyway, so I'll, uh, <laughs> you'll get the loosest lips I have. No, no, no. We'll extract some, some goodies from you. You've been busy. I have been busy. I don't know if busy is <laughs> equitable to, uh, you know, like successful or smart or any of those types of things. And as long as you stick around, I think that's the, the, the general <laughs> thing. It tends to, tend, tend to come out okay, right? Yeah, that's fair enough. I've been thinking, I'm just a massive, like, boomer when it comes to my risk taking and where I find edge and where I do most business in crypto. So, like, Primarily, I do best when I just long Bitcoin and some strong blue chip altcoins alongside it, right? Yeah. And like yeah. the way that typically manifests is in one of two ways. It's either shoving a ton of spot into the market when everyone else is getting liquidated, like in May, or it's when I get like a really strong bearish signal that gets invalidated. And that tends to present like really good setups as well. Um, so in effect, there's basically always someone really eating shit when I trade well. Uh, but if those con if those conditions aren't like present, if there isn't this like existential red candle crisis going on, um, my you know my big P and L trades, the ones which are responsible for the quarter, the year, etc., they tend to be quite dormant. So I really just need to de boomerify and go through this like ape fund thing, you know, that I tweeted about. I've got like five, ten percent put it in a portfolio and just get d dive into the yield farms, mint random shit with the lads, um, buy the altcoin tops and buy breakouts, you know, just kind of loosen up a little bit. Because you are very like nimble. Because I remember you were super early to DeFi making YouTube videos. You've been punting JPEGs for ages as well. Uh, can you can you give some context and maybe some tips on how to uh, get involved in new stuff without necessarily getting liquidated or like losing all your money. I think that'd be quite helpful, at least to me. Yeah. I mean, you just brought it right to the forefront because the primary goal I had today was to get you to be a degenerate. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, I would love to talk about this cred. And you, you actually brought up the way that I think is the most reasonable to do it within a normal person's risk profile, right? Is to take a percentage of your portfolio that you treat like a long call option that you're willing to go to ride to zero, right? Like you pay premium, let's say it's five or 10% of your portfolio, which in the volatility range of crypto, like do it after a really good day or a really good trade, take those profits and then throw them into this bucket. And it's zero or hero type stuff. And when I did that with DeFi Summer, cause I was not yet comfortable trading on chain and I had no idea what these coins were that I was trading. like. I was just trying to figure out like, oh, Ave is legit. It's a blue chip. I didn't know what that was. Like I just was trading anything that was popping up on Uniswap. So like it takes a while to learn some of those things. Therefore you're at risk. Um, that percentage of my portfolio that was minuscule turned into the majority of my portfolio. So if you have these asymmetric wins, it obviously makes it incredibly worthwhile to participate that way. So you can get the upside of crypto with 90% of your portfolio with whatever strategy that you're comfortable with, like you talked about, then you make these asymmetric upside bets with limited fixed risk downside of, Hey, I'm only committing X number of dollars, say $10,000 towards or, or 50,000, whatever, you know, some percentage, 5% of your portfolio towards these other types of bets. And if you lose it all on JPEGs, it was that portion of your portfolio that was within that bucket. You're not like, not able to pay taxes because you made all these realized gains in crypto and then you bet them all on JPEGs, your net worth is in JPEGs and JPEGs lose 80% of their value and now you're destitute. That's a pretty sad ending if someone's been in crypto for three, four, five years and then they like 
are like broke and breaking the law, <laughs> you know, whatever else could occur. <laughs> um, so I definitely think in these experimental realms, like there, you can still have conviction without risking your entire portfolio. And I think a lot of people think that those two are not, uh, are, are like mutually exclusive or whatever, you know, like you have to go in all in to do it with conviction. And in my opinion, like trying something new or trying something Innov innovative in the industry does doing it at all is to do so with some conviction um, and with within the realm of risk that you're willing to take you're having some conviction and then you're you're pushing that in that's your conviction but you're not like you're you always the goal is always to survive like every successful person you and I've ever talked to like the number one thing they say to do is to survive so that's still the most important component of all of this is to survive. And within that um, tolerance zone, you have to figure what can I put at risk? So it depends on the bucket, right? If it's JPEGs, it probably needs to be relatively small because the liquidity is just different. You can't market dump your JPEGs very easily unless you do so like on the floor of an NFTX pool. But you know, you're new, you probably don't even know what that is. Um, but if you, buy a freaking, um, I don't know, what's a popular JPEG, CryptoPunk, or that's, that's one thing, the liquidity is better in those. But if you buy like an obscure collection of 50 pieces, like you might literally have to hold that bag to zero. Like there's never gonna be someone to buy it from you and you were wrong. Um, so it, in that case, it needs to probably be smaller. Um, the smaller your stack, the more risk you're going to have of that unless you find a collection with like lower prices, lots of pieces, but has some uh, history or has some capacity to maintain value, et cetera. So it just depends on how, you know, what the profile of what you're trying to buy and how you're trying to participate. The same goal is the same. Don't blow up, but look for asymmetric upside. Um, and I was hoping to convince you to do, to do that. That's basically <laughs> the way I've approached it. Um, and I'm, so this is like an intervention, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> And See, I've, the thing uh, is, I think you're still faced with a, a similar difficulty because this has some, um, I think you can make a reasonable analogy with the whole degen account thing where you start off like, oh, I'll just like take, you know, high risk punts on high leverage and then something comes with, you know, you're, you're, you've basically written that amount off in your head. But then if something good comes of it, great, maybe you compound it and you play around with it and it grows into something else where a lot of people tend to blow up is when it goes from just an amount that's insignificant, a degen fund, whatever, and actually becomes quite a sizable part of your portfolio or even your main portfolio, or like starts to eclipse your conservative stack, whatever it may be, right? Like you've like a hundred X it and you're like, wait, this isn't play money anymore. Uh, what do I do? And I think it's that kind of adjustment period that catches a lot of people off guard because the whole way they got to that um, increased account size in the first place was by taking those high risk kind of write off trades. And then you get to a point where that amount that you've earned is no longer uh, the type of throwaway money that you started with. And then, then what do you do? Uh, do you think that's like a similar analogy with like oh, dude, it's JPEGs? And other it's, not just, it's not just JPEGs. I can actually give you the flow. And this is a little revealing towards my personal financial profile, but that's, allegedly, that's, right. That's, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Um, so like I'm in my thirties, my wife and I both work. Um, but I only worked in like a real job for a couple of years. So I committed a tiny amount of money to like a 401k that then I just left there because I started that basically when the, uh, the great recession started, I started working in late 2008. So I funded it with a minuscule amount of money for a couple of years. And then I, it just sat there for 10 years. So it, then all of a sudden I was like, Oh, I've got this, I forgot about this thing. Um, and it had like, I don't know, 10 X what my contribution was plus the match from the company and all that. And so then I was like, Hmm, this is interesting. I shouldn't just leave this here forever. I should do something so that I can active manage it and play with it because now it was like less than 10% of what my wife's 401k is, which she's been contributing to this whole time. Um, and then I started self-managing that within the equities market. Well, now my portfolio for that rollover 401k that I turned into an IRA for Americans that care, basically allowing me to self-manage it is now basically the same size as my wife's 401k. So that was asymmetric upside with like 10% of the risk, right? Self-manage a retirement account and now they're the same size. Additionally, my crypto initial investment was modest. Uh, it was more than some people, like some people are like, yeah, like, uh, 
you know, I mined Doge for like 12 minutes and, you know, I started with $20, $20 <laughs> and turned it into $20 million. Mine wasn't quite like that. Mine was like, I don't know, maybe like what, um, like used car level of investment, <laughs> depending on what kind of used car, at least enough ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, um, sure. And like, so it would have not been great if I like take this asymmetric upside investment idea where it's like less than our retirement, but you know, real money. And I say, dear family, I lost a Honda Civic. (laughs) 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 Um, So like that wouldn't have felt good, but that asymmetric upside bet also compounded and outperformed any other idea that I had. So this is why I think like pretty much the whole concept of just like stack stuff, compound index funds, it's a great way to sustain averageness. But if you can take a small percentage of those things and put them into something that are uh, decidedly have a high percentage chance of not being average, which that could be both directions, right? Zero or hero, then that is a worthwhile bet to make. Um, So in that scenario, like as good as my rollover 401k turned IRA thing has done, it is now minuscule in comparison to what I've been able to capture in crypto. But the only reason that's true is because even within crypto, I took those asymmetric upside bets because DeFi changed my life. Uh, JPEGs, I don't know that they've changed my life yet because I still have a, a decent amount that's not liquid. <laughs> yeah, we can come back to this in like a few months, right? Right, right. Yeah. If we look at the end of the year, we find out like, was that an asymmetric upside bet that like paid off? Or did I sink um, some profits into something that then I just ended up over invested and like, oops, <laughs> you know, like, when am I going to sell these? Uh, so we don't know that yet, but it was a worthy bet to take uh, similar to those other things. Um, I've been able to do some similar stuff with, with other things. Like sometimes this is not even monetary. It could be effort driven, right? So a podcast or like the ability to participate in the community turned into a up only, which is like financially actually quite promising, you know? Uh, So that's an asymmetric upside of effort uh, where things like that add up in life. And I think those are are bets that as entrepreneur minded people, like we're irresponsible if we don't take them. Yeah, I mean, the DeFi example in your case is like particularly hilarious, right? Because if you think about building out flip metrics now and then your understanding of DeFi like a year ago, yeah, I, 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 well, I didn't know what it was. I was like, why is yeah. I was like, why is why did Link go up the whole bear market? <laughs> it turned out like oracles are a big deal within the uh, the DeFi and on chain landscape. And I was, you know, I why why is synthetics pumping in 2019? What the heck is this thing? I better sell it. <laughs> you know, like I didn't even know what these tools <laughs> were. Uh, I didn't know what they were. Should have held your cake though, Ledger. Oh, man, yeah. See. Asymmetric outside, five thousand right. dollars in should have been half a million plus out, and instead it was five thousand dollars out. <laughs> like no. <problem. laughs> I mean, you did say zero heroes. So at least you're consistent as as to the outcomes. Yeah, right? but yeah, but that was where I didn't follow through with that. Right, like I threw it in there yeah. as an experiment, and then like the five thousand dollars wouldn't have killed me. It wouldn't have been great at the time, but like it wouldn't have killed me. <laughs> like that was what, like half a bitcoin or a third of a bitcoin at the time. Um, oh God! You know what? All oh, those numbers yeah. just. I know. Yeah, yeah. The numbers are up a lot. Just don't look. Just don't look. <laughs> you know what's been Max Payne for me recently? It's actually been Solana, and it's for two reasons. One is, I think three months ago, I just bought a lot of Solana for my sister and sent it to her block FTX, formerly Blockfolio. And I was like, yeah, just hold this. And then if it nukes, I'll maybe buy you some more. But, you know, anywhere from six months to four years, you know, you have to give them a totally useless range so you can, like, talk your way out of it if the performance starts being shit. Um, so I bought, bought her some Solana, and, you know, I've been outperformed by her in the past, whatever, weeks that I've been away because Solana has been absolutely mooning and my bags have not been mooning. Uh, So that's one thing. And then I think the most painful thing about Solana is if you go to the tweet where Sam tells Coin Mamba, you know, sell me your soul and fuck (laughs) off. uh, I've got a comment there. I've got I've got a comment there, that gif or gif, whatever, of stop, he's already dead from The Simpsons. So I'm there fucking commenting on how ridiculous this thing is, but I'm not I'm not buying any. So for me, every time like that thread comes up and it gets a bunch of likes, I had to mute it because the pain was too much, reminding me that I was too busy like shit posting on the on the thread instead of buying it, you know. Yeah, um, and since this is an intimate space, you know, people often ask me like, 
about my Solana history and trolling and not trolling and, whatever, <laughs> and like coping. And we can admit here that um, I'm not actually coping very hard on Solana because I won't express exactly how this has occurred, but I have some exposure to a very tiny amount of Solana, except for it was when Solana like barely existed. <laughs> and I have no control over when to sell, which has protected me from selling. So like I have this unrealized gain in Solana that is 50x my entire investment <laughs> yet Solana was a portion of that investment so like I actually own some Solana indirectly with long-term capital gains and it's like massive amounts of money relative to what was invested um, and yet I have like no control over it so like I don't know if I'll uh, realize the peak Solana at all in the long term but like I don't mind watching Solana go up at all um, oh well there you go yeah, it's one of those things that I think if, if we get the, one of those opportunities, which I mentioned at the beginning, where I can really start forking cash into the furnace, I think Solana is definitely like on, on, on my hot list of things. To, yeah, but like um, I'm not a psychopath, so I would have sold Solana like a million times along the way. Oh, right? for sure. Like, yeah, yeah, no doubt. No you doubt. know what? Is it, is it $3? Top. $10? Top. $50? Top. <laughs> yeah. I just did it the other day. I was like, $200? Going to be top. You know, it's like... Oh, man, I don't know. Just don't bet against Sam. Yeah, I know. He describes himself as like a Solana fanboy. So people are asking, like, you know, he's building out. The, there's like Solana, Serum, then FTX. Like that whole ecosystem is really quite clearly intertwined. And people are asking him about his exact involvement with Solana. And he said, I think, in a recent interview that he's a fanboy. I mean, yeah. that, that almost makes it even more bullish, right? It's just like if he's a well, fanboy. Yeah, like if Sam's a fanboy, he, he probably... Yeah, exactly. Like um, Anatoly, it just seems like one of those. Yeah, Anatoly and those other folks and some of the people that are backing them, like they're the ones that are really driving Solana. But what uh, Sam did through his various entities that he participates in is they became advocates of Solana for its use cases in different yes. ways. And like that is a huge backing force. And you need that with any um, asset or whatever else in order to for it to have a chance at succeeding. So it's like, it's kind of the best of both worlds for him. He can advocate for it, but he's not like responsible for it. I feel like Solana is one of those positions that I will just kind of out trade myself out of over the next two to five years. Do you know what I mean? Like I could probably go like time, if I could time travel two, three years uh, and Basically, I could just buy, like buy whatever, whatever, get exposure to Solana like right now and do nothing. I think there's a non-trivial chance that whatever two, three years down the line, just that decision would have outperformed my back and forthy type of type of bullshit um, that's going to fill fill those years. But of course, there's a recency bias because we've seen it go from like zero to whatever 200 it's like well that's over you know pack it up um it's 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 a bit of a, a bit of a mind fuck when you try to apply your short term or like medium term swing trading mindset to the stuff whose market cap is i mean even market cap as a relative metric may not be the most useful thing but i just think there's like certain things that you could, can buy and fuck off into a coma like ftt seems like one of them right i think yeah. i think you can see smoke coming out of binance at this point for better <laughs> or for worse uh, and it just kind of, and if you look at like how FTT, ftt's valuation relative to um, bnb it just doesn't in my opinion doesn't fully reflect the kind of reality we're headed into so there are a few of those positions in the back of my head like eth sol ftt relative to bnb etc that i kind of know i should have exposure to and lock up and just fuck off um but the trader in me has this hubris i suppose um which presupposes my ability to time all of this stuff and oscillate exposure etc etc and i just fear when we're having this conversation in two three years um <laughs> i will remember this spaces uh, and I, I will be far worse off than if i just you know passed out or something do you ever get that feeling like you just see these ecosystems growing and you're like wow i should just really buy this and find another hobby uh yeah and like i mean several people who i've been able to speak to over the last year um they're hilariously successful Lomashuk was one and he's just like 
Senor Iron Hands. Like that's like he's just a freak. He doesn't know how to sell. He'll never sell in his life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you don't. Once you get to a point where your bag is worth so much, like you can take a tiny loan against it to make that next asymmetric bet, and then use the yield from the initial to like pay off that. It's like you're you're rolling for free. Like the wealthy stay you know stay wealthy because they don't have to sell their bags right like they make committed bets to things that they believe in and then they really don't have to sell and and when they do it's like a relatively big decision and has like a significant reason um but like uh sue said early this year like if he could go into a coma for five years he would just do it because it would prevent him <laughs> from having these same feelings um and you know, both of those guys, like, they might be billionaires <laughs> so, like, and made from, like, also relatively small sums of money at the starting basis. And I don't think that you look at the assets that have truly succeeded in this ecosystem. And what was the presale for Ethereum, like 11 cents? Um, and then, you know, but of course, it was like trading publicly at a dollar and people thought they were genius for selling it at ten dollars. And now, like, you go buy Ethereum on Coinbase publicly in 2016 and you don't touch it and you are made basically like and as long as you bought like i don't know 200 bucks worth <laughs> like, like, that's pretty yeah, that's yeah. pretty incredible um so I, I i think that you don't just like ape absolutely anything but i think if you go in and you look at what are some of the things that i could ape that i can make a case internally within myself um, then those are the ones where you might say, hey, maybe I need to have iron hands on this bet. Um, now, there are times where, you know, I don't know, like maybe it's that loot thing, right? Maybe that ends up being one of these. But I, I looked at that and I was like, I don't understand it yet. Um, so on something like that, it's an NFT. It's a picture of a text. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> if I could have minted it for free, sure, I'll be Mr. Iron Hands on it uh, for some of it. But if I'm paying 15 ETH for it, maybe I'm looking for an entry opportunity and then like I consider my risk profile, like can I buy two, can I buy three, can I buy four, can I make up the profit so that I can roll one for free? Those are the types of decisions you end up making for like at, with what portion of this will I have the so-called moon bag? And I used to really make fun of people that use that type of term, but I get it better. I understand it better now than I used to because there are times where you legit just cannot see the upside like i'm sure there are people that bought like a hundred punks or something and they still have them and they're looking at it like what <laughs> you know like i forgot <laughs> i forgot i had these i just found them on a hardware wallet you know like they just and it's very difficult to identify those types of things and i think uh within crypto there are many things where it's better to just like try to act like a certain bucket of money does not exist and that's one of the biggest lessons I've tried to learn um, this summer. So I have some I have some bets out there where I'm trying to act like they don't exist, and I'm hoping I'll come back to them in six months or a year and they're life changing money. I just I don't know yet. Yeah, so this is the obvious question that follows as we talk about asymmetries as the time, effort, sectors, and so on. Uh, and you've got bets going on right now. And you know, if I were in the audience, I'd be thinking, you know, stop pontificating and share <laughs> some of those bets or some of those areas or what's what's on your radar. So in terms of uh, your out the money call options, Leggy, um, what kind of what kind of stuff are you looking at? Um, you could be as vague or as specific as you feel sure. appropriate. Obviously, not financial advice, blah blah, whatever. We're all clowns. Yeah, there's a couple of things where I've been able to participate in, like. Um, investing early in something. So that's not very helpful because it's not as accessible to as many people. But sure. as I've been able to get to know more people in the ecosystem, I've had better access to some of those things. So there's one coming out soon that I'm extremely excited about. Um, that's not useful for the person here, but I'll give an announcement of an announcement of a preset. <laughs> yeah. uh, but let's, let's, let's use a different example. So this is one, I don't even know exactly how I feel about it, but we'll find out. So within the Avalanche ecosystem, um, I think there's a good case that some of these EVM compatible layer ones um, that are not under Ethereum can make a real uh, case for themselves to exist relative to the layer two ecosystem. So Optimistic or Arbitrum or whatever else. So I pushed a decent chunk of money into the Avalanche ecosystem. So in this risk profile scenario that we talked about, it was okay. Um, 
in the ape fund, this is where I might differ from like what you might do with your ape fund, right? I'm willing to ape quite a lot if my risk of losing it is not that high or my like liquidity profile is not bad, right? So if I can sell. So I might be willing to ape more of my portfolio if I know I can also get out or like there's not a significant risk in addition to um, any other market. So I actually pushed quite a bit into the Avalanche ecosystem and despite the like turbo dump that it had in like a day as uh, the whatever other network Phantom um, announced some incentives, it still did very well uh, from where I started and then like recovered off of that as well so like now i have is that avax itself or no, avax no, no, plus no. like AVAX. joe and all the other stuff under yeah it. and it's it's more the other stuff under it so like i look at some of these yeah. and i say well what if joe is the next pancake or what if yak is the next like um wi-fi plus one inch combo which is kind of what that one is so like i look at some of those in relative market cap and i'm like okay well what's the upside if this hits like a billion dollars so if you get to a point where you can say, okay, I made money because I pushed a lot of chips and let's say I made 30%. Well, now that 30% is a lot, but it's relatively risk-free because if I just left it in Ethereum or something over that same time period, I wouldn't know the difference right now. So like that is an example where now it's a relatively reasonable amount of money and I stick it over there in something that yields quite well. Like you look at some of these things and it's like, okay, well there's 300% yield or there's 500%. And Specifically, what if you can achieve the yield where the token you're actually farming with is not the one providing the yield? Does that make sense? Um, it so does. I, I'll give an example. So like Yak is not inflationary. This is not trying to shill my altcoin. I, I don't care. Send it to zero, whatever. But like Yak supply is out there, kind of like Wi-Fi. Um, but like you can, you can pool or stake Yak with... Uh, AVAX, so your exposure is to Yak and AVAX, but you're receiving yield on Joe. Like, so you're earning Joe, which you might win, and then you're also not at risk to the inflation of the underlying stuff in your pool. Like, that's an example of one where I think I just want to let it roll for a while. I might change my mind tomorrow. <laughs> you know, like, I still am addicted to the charts of these things, but I kind of want to see, like, what happens if I just let that roll, because what if, you know, AVAX 3Xs or Yak becomes a billion-dollar protocol or yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah, I mean, from a management, you kind of alluded to it. From a management point of view, how do you uh, dance around that? Because you look at the charts, obviously, but then if your target is whatever, one, you know, 10x market cap, 100x market cap, etc., do you do anything in between? Um, like well, normally, I active trade the crap out of it and like then regret <laughs> it because you know you look at a chart of Joe and it looks like the whole you know meme market cycle within about five days, um, and so like Hasaka, right brain people. Uh, you know, he just bought Joe and it was like two cents and it went to two dollars and he was probably the red candle that nuked everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't care. He was up at like a billion X. Um, so I wasn't that person. So I had to manage it a little tighter early on because I was like playing low time frame charts and, and, and momentum and then not trying to, you know, get rinsed when something that's up 100 X goes down 30 percent. Well, guess what? You just lost all your profit, you know. So like I was trying to be careful and rotate and whatever. Now I'm in a position where I can take a percentage of what I put in overall and I can like set it aside and t take it out of my net worth in my brain and say, this is now the like eight budget for looking for asymmetric bets in the avalanche ecosystem because I've enabled that, right? Like I've, ina I've made enough to where I can now take this bucket of money and like go for it and try to pancake myself, right? <laughs> so like, forget about it, farm it, <laughs> auto compound it, come back in a bit and like the crypto markets haven't died and like, holy crap, like this Avalanche ecosystem actually grew because guess what? Freaking Suzu's like crazy bullish on Avalanche and I don't want to fade Suzu, not to mention it's like right at price exploration. So what if this is an equivalent of some of these other projects where they went from like 10 billion to $50 billion market cap as a broad ecosystem and the underlying tokens some of them went absolutely ballistic if i just if i just embrace that potential and i'm also playing relatively with house money at that point what do i have to lose you know and like that's how i'm trying to look at that as and i think anybody could do that like right this moment there's nothing special about the entry point at the, at where i am like maybe it's not even gr a great one you could look at it look at it in the same exact way but 
wait until there's some panic candle um, in the next week and buy it for a 40 or 50% discount because these things are hella liquid, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that conceptualization is like pretty intuitive. One of the memes which kind of pertains to what we've been discussing that's quite popular on the CT right now is the one about what's the next Solana? And obviously Solana is the next Solana, right? <laughs> and they're like, what's the next Axis? It's like Axis is the next Axis, right? So essentially, well, you know, for, for audience members that are unaware, it's poking fun at the idea that um, once you have a leader in a sector or in the market, whatever it is, um, there's a tendency to feel late to it and to look for proxy longs. So you end up basically longing everything except the thing that you're actually bullish in the first place, right? Um, where do you fall in that debate? Because I know you, you have no problems generally buying multiples if you think yeah. the upside's there. Um, whereas other traders are much more kind of, well, you know, that I'm going to wait for the hot ball of money to move or trickle down elsewhere. Uh, I ge I'm generally much on kind of the first side as well. If it's strength, I'm going to buy strength. And I assume there's a reason why it hasn't rotated yet or, you know, momentum continuation is just more likely than, um, do you remember those 2018 charts? Would you buy this when everything was going to zero and just kind of moving sideways, like that very mm. sad period? That's yes. kind of the thing yeah. I don't want to get stuck in. Uh, how do you, where do you, how do you reconcile those things? Do you, you don't mind buying strength if it's strong, I'm right? Not, I'm not as good at it as you are. Um, I'm, uh, I, I have lost money as in like sideways in USD <laughs> while something else like tur <laughs> turbo trends. Um, I have done that many times looking for a catch up trade. And uh, it's interesting. I was talking to Sam Trabuco recently. It seems like their quantitative models kind of look for those opportunities at times. And I could be misunderstanding the way they play those. But if I understood it correctly, it seemed like sometimes they, they purposefully look for stuff that uh, is out of balance with the momentum of the rest of the market, AKA seeking laggards, buying laggards, selling laggards a little higher. Um, I, I, I think with like the bigger ideas though, and I don't know what their time frame is on those. They may be doing it over the course of a 30 minute trade. Right. I don't really know. Um, but for the bigger things, almost always, it seems like the winners just keep winning faster than the laggards catch up. Yep. And you look at Axie and like, you're like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to play, you know, I don't know, like double Axie, like some, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, 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 that doesn't end up working. Um, so you should have just bought into that big fat green candle on Axies and like, Solana being another example. Yeah, right? Solana's a great example. And, um, I don't know. It's like, I, I'm still learning how to play the, uh, buy massive strength, like something up 40% on the day buy it at market and then hope it goes up another 40% tomorrow. Um, it's not always quite that strong, but like a good example is, okay, this thing just thrust into price expiration. So I should go ahead and get like an initial entry here and then I can get a secondary entry if it like goes and retests that, right? The, that level. And then yeah. I kind of have my entry somewhere in the middle there and I can have my cut point. So I'm not like totally irresponsible to risk management. Um, but like I have a bet that I've made now and I can seek upside and maybe that, uh, maybe that upside is only half the size I originally intended because I entered in this two stage process and it never retested. It just turboed up forever. That's okay. Like I'm willing to take this bet with that size. Um, but if I get filled, then great, there's the full position. Um, and then you find out your, you know, your R as you know, your, your technical analysis videos explain very well with the risk reward profile and where you cut the bag and where you're actually seeking it to go. Are you looking for a price exploration with a fib extension or whatever you tool you use to identify where it could go? And then you, you see what happens. Um, and I, I'm still learning to do that because I really like, if I'm looking at the DeFi landscape and let's say like, I don't know, Ave is up 20% and compound is flat my brain almost always says go buy compound, <laughs> you know, like sometimes yeah, that, I know, I know <laughs> <laughs> sometimes that might be the right move. Um, but a lot of times it's not like a lot of times, you know, something's up because it should be up. 
Um, and, and it's going to be up more while your other thing continues to be a laggard. Yeah, that, that's how I've always viewed it, right? You're, you're almost making fewer assumptions when you long the one with strength because the market's already kind of signaling that there's something there, someone lifting those offers, right? And it almost feels like if you play the lagging one, that you know that there are more assumptions baked into why it's going to catch up. And again, not only does it have to catch up to the one that you're not buying, ideally it outperforms it because otherwise the one that's leading is the better long anyway, right? So it just seems like a bit of a tall order at yeah. times. I think generally yeah. like breakout trading or momentum continuation gets a bit of a bad rap in crypto trading circles for very understandable reasons because uh, they tend to get highlighted when we get failed breakouts or a lot of it is basically 2018 PTSD from like 2018, 2019 PTSD when breakout trading on like BitMEX <laughs> was what everyone was doing and losing our accounts to, right? So that it's was a essentially a non too, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. But if you're in the appropriate regime where breakouts are trend forming primarily, uh, those can be some pretty good trades because they also give you like a nice invalidation as well, right? You know that if the breakout level fails, you get out, you don't have to bag hold at minus 50, minus 70, whatever. And those breakouts tend to resolve pretty quickly on the whole as well. Um, even if it breaks out and it starts to like stall or stop, you can just, you know, if the idea becomes less attractive, you can still exit probably in profit at that point as well. There's, there are some appeals to it, even though I'm by no means some expert breakout trader. Yeah, there's another element to this too, because it's, that's an opposite play of what you talked about earlier of like, you know, when everybody's getting liquidated, go buy it. Um, <laughs> yeah. That also like, let's take our example earlier. Okay. Ave goes up 20% compounds flat. And then the market reverses and Ave completely retraces it and compound goes down 20% or maybe 30%. Like, so which one should you buy there? Well, you should probably buy the one that's actually still trending, not the one that's like losing all right. the important levels. So in either scenario, whether you're buying the blood or um, buying the, the breakout, you should still be seeking the more trending asset. And then that creates this... Um, uh, essentially this environment where like all the money tends to flow towards the, the top coins, right? And um, the big stuff gets bigger and all of a sudden you've got ADA at like a hundred billion dollar market cap. <laughs> That's been a fun one to follow. Have you been reading Eric Wall, um, Eric Wall's tweets on Cardano and how their um, UTXO based DEX does like one transaction public it's some absolutely bizarre thing where it's just technically I, not I didn't as, know they had not, a, not where it should be i'm impressed they have a dex i didn't realize yeah it's in this very <laughs> early stage yeah it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a um I, anyway i recommend people follow eric wall and read into some of the stuff that's been coming out of the ada community as regards to yeah. their um there are some, the functions of the platform let's put it that way there are some that i will just straight up write off as in i i still i still and to my detriment sometimes want to provide this screen of like, am I willing to sleep in this bag, hold this, whatever else, um, from a fundamental perspective, I don't think ADA really has a place in the crypto world. Like I don't believe in ADA long-term similar to like XRP. Now, both of those would have been fantastic freaking trades. Like I would have probably made more money in those than some of the things I was willing to sleep in, but that's where I kind of create my separation of what I'm willing to participate in and what I'm willing to trade. And I just, I, I put that screen on because it allows me to do things with a degree of commitment and a little less skepticism. Like if I'm just trading things I hate all the time, I might actually be profitable, but that's not, I don't like that, right? Like it's pretty, it's pretty depressing, you know, to constantly be invested. So, in sounds like elite midwittery to me, Ledger, <laughs> being completely honest, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> like I, I, I would probably be better at, um, taking profits, dumping them or whatever else. Like if I, if I was completely heartless in the matter and was like, everything is a scam, therefore I will trade it. <laughs> you know, like that. Um, I think Kobe did well, that. Well, scams lot. pump the hardest, right? Yeah. You go, you go to the other extreme where yeah. the most opportunity will be in the, in the most dog shit assets. Yeah. It's the hundred IQ part of me where like, I just hold on to it, I guess. <laughs> No, I mean, that's understandable. Look, in terms of the market itself, generally, right now, uh, we've talked about 
I mean, look, it's very telling where we are sort of price-wise and cyclically that we've not spoken about Bitcoin or ETH at all in, in like 40 minutes, right? Um, you tried to do that a couple of months ago, it'd be quite difficult. Uh, do you care? I mean, even before I ask you what you think of Bitcoin, do you care about where Bitcoin is right now? Do you, do you factor that in to your allocation, rebalancing, rotation, etc.? Uh, and then I guess the second part is what, what do you reckon of this um, 50k push what what's happening in your in your eyes um i think the broad trend of bitcoin still matters for like what the market is going to do um you can't you can't ignore the fact that bitcoin from a dominance perspective is not doing well right <laughs> like there's there's a lot of headwinds for bitcoin in my mind from a pr perspective from a narrative perspective um and you know, you add in like the 1559 stuff with Ethereum and you even get to the monetary policy perspective. Like when Ethereum goes proof of stake, it might become deflationary. It would based on today's current activity. I don't know about future activity. Um, now, Bitcoin is deterministic, but are we really narrowing the Bitcoin bull argument down so low to say uh, this is not really a medium of exchange. It's a store of value, but now it's a deterministic store of value. So like it may be, uh, I don't know, like how narrow can you get with like justifying Bitcoin? At the end of the day, like I'm very bullish Bitcoin. Um, it still has the network effects that are dominant in the ecosystem. You go ask a bunch of people, what is Bitcoin? What, like what competes with that? Um, not much. I don't think Ethereum does yet. Doge may, which is interesting. Um, so like, but, but therefore you have like Doge kind of coming at it in some ways. Um, Ethereum coming at it in some ways. Um, and then like there's, I don't know, the, the environmental stuff is a huge problem for proof of work from a PR perspective. Um, so there's, there's a lot of battles for Bitcoin and like if they properly gold themselves, is that good? <laughs> you know, like from a performance perspective is being a gold bug, like really the, make you the most successful, uh, investor over the course of time. Like it may give you stability. And if you're seeking stability, perhaps you'll achieve that with Bitcoin. But if you're seeking upside, like I think the majority of our time is better spent seeking, um, expansion, right? From a technology perspective and from a growth perspective and potential perspective. And I think you could approach it that way where like if Bitcoin is gold and I don't know, the, the smart contracts ecosystem is like the NASDAQ. Um, most of the time you probably want to be in the NASDAQ and then in bear markets, gold is good because the NASDAQ is going to get crushed. Um, so that's one way I'm kind of thinking about it. Um, but since Bitcoin is still such a big part of the ecosystem, uh, whereas in stocks or like anything like that, if gold goes down, it doesn't mean the stock market goes down, right? But if Bitcoin goes down, all the altcoins go down. So there's, there's it's not. Yeah, that, that's that's where I get stuck, right? I just see a a very obvious or at least to me compelling absence of evidence that you can have a good secular uptrend in crypto without Bitcoin looking good or trending up as well, right? Yeah. Uh, and the people who held that thesis were the ones who got like rinsed the most. The whole decoupling, de you know, dispersion, DeFi, it's got its own cash flows. Like those people got fucking taken to the cleaners, like completely rinsed on that thesis. Uh, as soon as Bitcoin like farted, you know, it's down 55% <laughs> and then all their bags went like minus 80 or just full retraced everything. So, you know, if, if recency is... Uh, telling at all, which to me it is, um, I just don't feel super confident punting altcoins when I don't think Bitcoin is a tailwind. I, I just still think we're, maybe the asset class is not mature enough yet, uh, but the market still generally seems to treat uh, altcoins as either beta or like margin, right? <laughs> At least if the correlations that, w that we regularly see and are I, to be I, believed. I, I, go one, on. Yeah, one, I completely agree. Two, I think that'll be true for quite a while. Um, but within the spectrum of a bull market, like I, it's when you're fundamentally doubting if the cycle is over or not that where that really becomes true, because then it's this liquidity profile. Like Bitcoin has the deepest liquidity in all of crypto, I believe. Um, so therefore it's kind of natural that if people are starting to exit and dominance is down, then like they're 
they're essentially sinking the floor on on um, all these other bags, and it kind of reinforces the Bitcoin dominance of the market, not just like actual dominance, but you know the the path of downside um, if Bitcoin becomes weak, and that'll probably be true for a long time. And it doesn't like that could always stay true. It doesn't mean like that analogy that I just gave of, you know, Bitcoin is gold and, and everything else is the NASDAQ. Like that doesn't have to be the way this plays out in the long term, because obviously it breaks down based on what you just said. Um, but I think that when the market is strong, we can essentially approach it in a similar manner because that'll give us that better chance at upside. Um, it, in the long term, though, like, I don't know, I still think I denominate to some degree in Bitcoin because it's easier for me to set targets for like, okay, do I think 100K Bitcoin is possible? Yes. Do I think 250K Bitcoin is possible? Yes. Um, and therefore, like, it makes me want to denominate in something that I think it's going to go up in the long term. Uh, but I'm, I have more and more, and there's a variety of reasons for this, I do tend to like, I, I think I have a better understanding of how like how many Ethereum my net worth would be <laughs> versus like how many Bitcoin, right? <laughs> um, and the reason is because Bitcoin or Ethereum has so much going for it, has better answers to some of the PR issues, like the, uh, you know, the moving to proof of stake versus proof of work. That, in, that environmental debate is so much bigger than I would have anticipated like a year ago. Um, Ethereum has an answer for that. Ethereum is has a, a, a more active... Uh, solution for scaling that's multi-pronged and competitive and very interesting. Whereas Litecoin uh, development scene, or not Litecoin, that's hilarious. Uh, Lightning uh, <laughs> develop, oh development seems to have been strong, but it actually seems to be by relatively few parties and very narrow in its scope until like you hear like this cope of, well, DeFi will actually be on Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff. Um, the active capital markets and, uh, you know, build out and competition for layer two, alternate layer one, whatever scalability for smart contracts and, and crypto activity, and therefore creating inherent utility for a cryptocurrency seems much more focused on EVM, uh, therefore emboldening the network effects for Ethereum itself. And therefore, I think like there is a case to be made for um, Ethereum to render Bitcoin less important in the long term. Um, and the Bitcoin relative to Ethereum chart or Ethereum ETH BTC chart kind of plays that out, right? Like it's been quite strong. And even in the depths, like it was maybe one of the best indicators that in fact, the market was not over because ETH BTC just did not break down. Like it continued to look strong, looks like it was just normal consolidation. And looking at it today, it looks like it wants to go to all time highs. Like it, the ETH BTC chart is, uh, incredible. <laughs> you know, so like that's, it gives me some confidence to stay exposed to the market and also stay denominated in Ethereum. Yeah, I mean, that, that answer isn't entirely surprising. If you think about it, like where you do most of your economic activity, right? Like DeFi denominated in ETH per se, right? In itself, JPEGs as well, um, flip metrics where you're building out a lot of that, those conversions and that activity is going to be in ETH as well. Um, yeah, so that, that bit isn't terribly surprising. But also just on the general point that you brought up, I've never found it compelling when like something in crypto becomes cool or popular and then bitcoiners try to like how, how do i describe this it's like yeah you basically mentioned okay DeFi is cool and it's on ethereum but you can have DeFi on bitcoin so just come you know you don't need ethereum come back to bitcoin or like nfts you know on, on ethereum or even other chains and they always try to drag it back no we can have nfts on bitcoin it just seems kind of sad <laughs> but also fundamentally unnecessary i really personally don't mind a um thing is you can call it a narrow value proposition for bitcoin but you can also call it a specific value proposition for bitcoin right i think it's almost down to phraseology at that point uh, but i i have no issues bitcoin being bitcoin and then other parts of crypto doing other parts of crypto that they're better engineered uh, or specifically designed to handle while knowingly making those trade-offs as to whatever decentralization security whatever you want to call it like i'm fine with that uh, it always just seems very, I don't know what you think, it just always seems very copy to me when anything becomes like cool or innovative in crypto and there's this like hark back, like, no, no, we can do this on Bitcoin, just wait this indeterminate amount of period. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just like as someone who really likes Bitcoin and values its core value proposition, uh, I've never found that argument to be compelling and think it like dilutes its main value prop. If anything, you know, it's and like reverse it, cope or whatever. If it's going to be compelling, then it needs to be with similar parameters that Bitcoin itself is, which is I would say like very secure. Uh, if you're gonna crap on DeFi you know, you can just point at like a jillion hacks and like billions and billions of dollars <laughs> like funnel out of the yeah. ecosystem to hackers because of lazy code and whatever else. So like if the hardness of the application layer of Bitcoin is its feature, that's a fantastic feature. And yes, over time, five years from now, you say like, look, we nailed, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, DeFi functions on Bitcoin on layer two. And now you can transact in Lightning, because I do think uh, Bitcoiners are underestimating how important medium of exchange is and the ability to pay for your coffee, uh, a la like Roger Ver's argument. Even if he was very cringe, I do think that's an important component, right? Like just holding Bitcoin and like looking at it in my wallet and yet not like having to wait an hour to send it to my friend CryptoCred for dinner is stupid. Um, like if I want to send you some sats, I want them to show up, uh, like really quickly and Bitcoin freaking sucks at that. And layer two is a very important component of that. And honestly, this is important for I mean, Ethereum and Bitcoin alike, because Ethereum is the fee structure more than the time that you wait. Like I need to, people need to be able to be layer two primary. Uh, so like their existence within crypto is on layer two only. And it's kind of an, absurdity for them to ever have to transact or participate in layer one because why in the world would i ever want to spend like fifty dollars to send you a hundred dollars you know or or wait an hour and both bitcoin and ethereum are having that issue i just see the path forward to like broad adoptance ad, ad, adoptance is that a word <laughs> adoption nice. I, like it. <laughs> I just see the path forward for broad adoption of a layer two ecosystem uh, that seems simpler in the Ethereum landscape to me. So like, who's going to build the Venmo of crypto, like the dead simple mobile app where I type in crypto cred and like can send you some money. It seems like that's going to be more likely to be on like an Ethereum layer two network than it will be on, uh, like, uh, lightning and stuff, but I'm getting a little bit out of my like comfort zone. I just, I'm comfortable in the suite of products that can exist on layer two doing that uh, with the Ethereum ecosystem more so than I am in the Bitcoin ecosystem, because not only can I send my friend cred, you know, like $8 for our, uh, you know, glass of wine or whatever, I can also- You like, can drink those $8 glasses of wine by yourself, mate. I'm not having any of that. <laughs> I can also um, be earning yield on it while I'm, you know, like in my wallet. And it's like my, my you know, the, the unbanked concept and all that, like it seems cleaner in the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, certainly being experimented on more and all that. And uh, therefore, I, I think like the average person will probably be on mobile first experiences fully on layer two interacting within the Ethereum ecosystem where hopefully most of the protocols and stuff are relatively blind and therefore you're just using like, let's say, let's shout out rainbow.me. It's a wallet, but it's like very Zoomer friendly, <laughs> you know, like I'm just in rainbow, right? And I'm like doing all my stuff, but I'm doing it directly on layer two. And like, I never interact with ETH layer one and certainly not like, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, stuff. and. I can see that being like a real path forward and a way for adoption to occur for crypto apps um, to where the like crypto ness starts to become invisible. Yeah. And for people wanting broader or lengthier comments on that, the actual podcast episode we recorded at the lows, um, first of all, aged really well, but second of all, we, we talk about the, the you know the, the the longer term view there, which which I highly recommend. Um, from longer term to short term, are you worried about any of the uh, froth that seems to be building up in altcoin futures specifically? I'm just looking at some of these funding rates and premium and the the APR that you get from them. Um, it, it's and you know Dan from CMS went on up. I think you I mean you, you spoke to him, and I think yeah. he was quite overt that there's a lot of uh, leverage in the system right now. I'm kind of looking right at it. 
I mean, 200, over 200% 200 APR to stay long Cardano with its <laughs> UTXO DEX. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it just seems uh, it seems like a tricky place to be long altcoins, but not only because of funding rates. Um, my, my personal thesis for altcoins, like the, you know, the majors on their USD pairs, and the reason I'm not aping in, for one is, as I covered, I don't yet have an overt Bitcoin long signal. It's pretty close to my system giving me something, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, as for altcoins themselves, given our proximity to all-time high, and also the fact that whatever 50k is just kind of inflection point, I still see the long altcoin trade being a long, a short Bitcoin vol trade, right? Because if Bitcoin whatever dumps from here and this breakout doesn't stick, altcoins are going to die with it and do worse. Uh, but I think if Bitcoin really breaks out and you see a shift to dominance and uh, a, a move towards you know basically the 50k to 60k rotation, I think old BTC pairs uh, will get hammered as well. Uh, and for me, this, you know, we went sideways for a bit and we're currently poking above that 50 type of area um, or trying to. It just doesn't seem to be the most appealing spot to be short Bitcoin vol or long altcoins, certainly not paying 200 uh, percent APR for the privilege. I don't know what you think. Uh, I don't trade on margin derivatives because I can't. Um, but like. Yes, I think in the short term, that could be the type of thing where you get one of these 18% down days and it's like a fantastic buy, right? Because it just takes out all the open interest, it liquidates everybody that was over leveraged, resets the funding rates, and then you can have two weeks of like turbo upside and all those people are coping because they're out. Um, because 18% uh, what you're locking out anybody that's like 4X leverage or lower basically, uh, or higher. Um, I look at the Bitcoin dominance chart and it's one of the ugliest charts I've ever seen. Uh, unless you look at it from a range perspective, because then we were like quite close to the 2018 levels. Um, I know a lot of people talk about it being a meme. Uh, Pentoshi is a good example of someone who like really, really, really loves trading off of Bitcoin dominance charts and has been quite successful at it. Um, I do think Bitcoin could rain on everybody's parade in a bullish manner or a bearish manner. And you could see, you know, some panic in altcoin markets in the short term. And that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, when I look individually, though, at charts, I don't know, man. I see, like, uh, obviously, Solana has already been turbocharged, but Ethereum looks like it wants all time highs. AVAX looks inf absolutely incredible coming into all the things that it has going on. So it's going to be a test of are bullish unlocks a meme or is this going to be like everybody now thinks bullish unlocks are a meme and this thing gets smoked when, you know, all these people's <laughs> coins unlock. Oh, the game theory. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just look at the charts and I'm like, mm, I'm not fading like Ethereum here. Right. I, I, it looks really good. Like it's just, Maybe it'll consolidate under all time highs relative to USD and pull back a little bit relative to BTC. But I looked at that BTC relative chart earlier, looked freaking fantastic in the long term. So, yeah, sure, 20% down in a day might just end up looking like a nothing burger on the longer term chart. Oh, for sure. Um, and I don't, I don't personally see like a Bitcoin takes over and off it goes until it finds price expiration. And there were, I don't know, February 15th, Bitcoin went to 58K or so. And then between 58, 64, it spent all the way until May 10th when everything nuked. So, you know, March, April, May, three months of distribution up there, which it's now like hitting the underside of. And um, my general thought would be that takes some time to work through. Am I right? Mm, the market will know. Um, I think <laughs> paring down and like hitting majors a little harder is probably smart. So in a practical perspective of that, like what I have done is do I have like 50% of my net worth in the Joe token? No. Uh, <laughs> Have I maintained 60 at least? <laughs> have I maintained exposure via AVAX? Yes, because I actually think, you know, like I would, I'm okay with AVAX exposure. It looks like it just wants to thrust it to like a hundred dollars, you know, like a double. Um, and we look at what Solana did. It went five X after off the bottom or something, you know, it's like, okay, tap 200 day moving average and then just infinitely bid. 
Um, and AVAX looks like it's going to price expiration. So I want to be exposed to it for some of those things. But the liquidity profile of going from AVAX to ETH, AVAX to USDC, AVAX to BTC, wherever is necessary, uh, if that starts to become untrue, I'm not wealthy enough to where like I can do one transaction and I'm out. You know, I, it, it takes me 12 seconds and it costs, 40, it, co it costs about 40 cents on the AVAX network. Um, or like I bridge back over and do it, whatever. Um, it's very, yeah, very, yeah, it's course. very, very simple to change my mind when my primary exposure is in stuff that is liquid. Um, so I've maybe reduced my exposure to the illiquid things. Like I don't want to be like a 10% candle on an altcoin, <laughs> you know, like you don't, oh, have, yeah. well, I you think don't, we've all been there. You don't have to have a ton of money on some of these altcoins to be a 10% candle. So. Oh dude. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's quite shocking how quickly <laughs> you just build up a, ton, a bit of size. You like average an entry and suddenly you're like double digits, open interest, like mid double digits. You're like, Oh, well, this, and it's on, it's on FTX as well. Then God help you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think with like the altcoin derivatives, I, I really like a point you made. Uh, I think there are two things to note. One is like sometimes, not always, but sometimes funding can be counter trend. That is to say you have high funding because everything is bullish and you just need to have a kind of cost to being long if no one wants to take the other side. Like I remember, you know, I think it was in the 20s on the way up in Bitcoin or even before that, like we, we had pretty high funding just on Bitcoin. But then it just makes sense because everyone wants to get long and there has to be a cost to that or an incentive to uh, keep the perp in line with the index. Right. Uh, but I think there can be a bullish resolution to this altcoin froth, which is Bitcoin ripping up, alt BTC nuking, a bunch of those alt longs get liquidated. And as you mentioned, you bid those licks as Bitcoin does its whatever 50 to 60K rotation, if that sets up. I think that makes sense. Um, but, you know, funding isn't always like a necessary precursor of direction. Like you only get interesting setups when funding and price really diverge. So when futures get really aggressive and don't get paid for the efforts, like when we had at the lows, right? How, lo how long did we spend having like negative funding at 30K and slightly below it, et cetera, uh, without price breaking down or moving? So the same kind of applies. It's, it's like a kind of ticking clock type of thing. Like you're happy to pay the exorbitant funding if in your mind your PL makes up for it, you don't care. But if you're paying exorbitant funding and the market isn't moving in your favor or even moving against you, that's when you get that type of trickiness. Um, so yeah, it's just some some context on the altcoin pairs. But I'm still personally wouldn't you know depends on the majors you could liquid liquidity profile completely agree um i just think we're a bit of an inflection point i do want to get your take on this hot take right um that i've got and i've literally made a note of it to see what you think um and it's the following i think if you round tripped like your crypto experience like i don't know you bought bitcoin at 40 50 it doesn't really matter that much you held it um and then you held it all the way down 28 whatever including altcoins you know you just had a classic beginner crypto portfolio uh you ate shit but you held which is already better than <laughs> i think most of us <laughs> right uh, on our first time uh, and then then you know the market starts to rip and then it's back so you see bitcoin at 50 eth at 4k getting there in more or less a straight line my kind of hot take is that i would find it hard to criticize anyone sort of taking profit or moving stops up or taking tax money out at least etc with bitcoin at 50k and eth at 4k and my reasoning is pretty straightforward because if the double bubble thesis is correct and everything goes to all-time high and melts up and it's this insane once every several cycle opportunity then you quote unquote miss out on maybe the first impulse but such insanity will follow that you'll probably be able to buy like anything, sort of monkey on a dartboard type of purchases at any time and make back multiples of whatever you took out of the market at a potential inflection point, right? So basically, double bubble is so absurdly bullish if that comes to manifest that anything that you de-risk at a possible inflection point before double bubble gets validated, you'll make back in a snap. So it's kind of plus EV to manage exposure uh, in this area. What, what do you think of that? Uh, man. So I, I've done some of that, I guess. I never took profit um, in crypto ever, right? Like I, ne I never took anything out of the market unless it was to play taxes. Uh, so this year is the first time I've ever done that. And I'm now rolling on house money by many multiples based on what I took out to take care of the things that were most important in life for me. Um, from there, 
uh, you know, Dan said the other day, like, where are you going to go? Right. Like if you want to stay invested, if it's money that you're not going to use for like real life things, where are you going to go? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to stay exposed? So like t it depends on what you mean by taking profit. If you are, like need to pay off your student loans or you need to put a down payment on your house or you need to do those type of things, then I am 100 percent in agreement with you because those are the types of regrets that, to be quite honest, like, you know, when I would hit like screenshot my portfolio type territory in 2017, those, <laughs> <laughs> those, <laughs> you know, you've been there. Um, those were the types where it was like extreme levels of regret for the next two years as like I was, it was the top, I was wrong and I could not do that anymore. I could not, you know, take care of the stuff that I felt like I should have taken care of. So my point for my own life and don't take it as financial advice, yada, uh, is like taking care of that stuff at 4k. I completely get 4k ETH and whatever we're at at Bitcoin completely agree. Um, I also think that that mentality for your whole portfolio is a good way to like paper hand the potential asymmetric upside of a big move up. And I actually think that we're gearing up, not necessarily right away. I'm a, I have a chart pulled up on my own computer that I'll, I'll show you later and you can visualize, but like we may have one of these kind of parabolic blow off tops on some of these things that is like multiples of your net worth type of potential. Um, and I want to be there for that. Like I'm not going to be all out by any means. Do I want to be active? Do I want to maintain my buying power? Do I want to be in a position of control, which is a concept cred that like I had to listen to you talk about half a dozen times before it starts to like, <laughs> hit me in the face because like I'm over here coping my portfolio down 40% on the way to the driving to the beach and creds like I just bought the Pico bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and then sold it ass. two days later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was the right move. It was the right move. Like, um, and so like that position of, of control is very important. And I want to be in that. I want to be in a place where I can make rotations and put myself in a better position. So the way for me to do that is maybe my exposure is in Ethereum and I'm Ethereum denominated for a while. And like I can then go buy the stuff that gets nuked by 60, 70 percent in the avalanche ecosystem. And like then it pulls multiples. Right. I make up for the Ethereum downside in the shitcoin upside. Um, that's one way to do it. The other is to be in cash until there's an obvious play. So. Let's take two scenarios. One, price expiration from here on, let's say, Ethereum. I got that chart up at 3,900. We're very close to prior all-time highs. Two, downside. If we have downside, my bet is we actually repeat uh, 2017. And what is stunning about it is in 2017, Ethereum went to $400 in like January and, and February. So think of that as an equivalent to like what where to kind of all the ETH DeFi stuff topped out. And then it came back and tested the prior all time high. <laughs> no kidding. The end of August in 2017, before it had two down weeks consolidated until November and then pumped from 400 to 1400. Cred, you look at this chart today it looks like a freaking repeat. It like ETH looks like if it went down, it would go to like 2,500 consolidate and then at the end of the year be pegging 4K again, and it has this chance to go to like 10, 15K. Like if we get the gift of downside and consolidation and ETH USD, and you're in the position of control and you're taking your current portfolio value and you're like plugging that into this like enormous consolidation that's occurred all year. And when it thrusts out, you get a two to three X in a highly liquid coin. That's not a problem. That is a gift. So, oh, listen, mate. We all know that dips are only gifts when the candles are green. As soon as the actual <laughs> dip starts happening, you just shit yourself when you yeah, move your like, targets if, down like twenty percent. And <laughs> if you tell me, like, hey, tomorrow Ethereum is going to be twenty five hundred, like, my stomach is in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. But like, if I zoom out, if you will, I hate that term, but if I do that. I look at this potential setup, this potential scenario of like higher macro lows, let's say Bitcoin saves, I don't know, 35K or something. And then you end up with this like six month consolidation. Everything else in the world is basically the same. Like nobody really wants dollars. We're printing money. Who knows what we're doing? Who cares? 
we get this some kind of bullish consolidation and then you see this opportunity and by the way this is how your dominance gets like recovered in that whole scenario so you have two scenarios here one i bet that it goes up and we go to 6k and that was fun two it goes down but i don't think it's like death of all things and it's just going to consolidate and and give us an opportunity later neither of those are bad it's just we're impatient in the second scenario and like we i don't know cash out capitulate get liquidated whatever else um i'm willing to bet that one of those two scenarios happen before we like go negative 90 percent you know and like the party's over this is the top see you later um that's a bet that i'm willing to take and another is like both can be protected against now scenario number three bull market over down we go see you later um, I make the least amount of money in that, obviously, because I've taken these other two bets. One, price expiration. Two, consolidation over a long-term period. Three, bull market over. Well, two out of these three options, both, like one, they seem much more likely to me. And also, I make a lot more money in them, and I can be, um, there can be evidence to say that I'm wrong in those, and I like take my 15% loss and, and wait for the next one. Um, I want to take those bets pretty much. <laughs> you know, like if, if the, if the market is over, I've taken care of the life stuff. Like you mentioned, right? Like we are back at all time highs. My portfolio is at an all time high. Took care of the life stuff. If you need to take care of life stuff, take care of your life stuff. If you're looking for like, what's the most likely scenario? Um, I think that's a counter trend play to say the bull market is over versus saying like there might be some rotation of cash, et cetera. Yeah, that's a reasonable way of looking at it. Uh, I generally say that you never want to risk your ability to take risk because what's the fucking point otherwise? So that applies and, you know, that means different things to different people. Like it could mean taxes, it could just mean cash, real life obligations, whatever. Uh, but you've got, you've got to fix that first, right? I mean, without that, what's what's the point of it all? Um, I, like, for me... I trade setups more so than like trends, right? So it's not as simple as, oh, we're in a bull market and I'm going to be long, we're in a bear market, I'm going to be in cash, whatever. It, it, it's just a matter of setups, which kind of has, which kind of makes life easy. The downside of that is, of course, the holding periods um, are shorter and it's harder to participate like fully in trends because normally I'll have a target as opposed to have just like, um, like if you think about profit taking, this is a bit of a tangent, but they, m for most people, it ends up being one of two things, right? They either have a target like in advance set out in their head for the trade or the investment even, or they will basically hold it until they have some sort of exit signal or some pre-existing parameters to close the trade are met, right? That, that, those seem to be the two broad kind of profit taking categories. Uh, so, so for me, for, it was like a basic assessment of um, even in the most bullish scenario, is there a chance that we get a non-trivial pullback slash correction before an all-time high in Bitcoin? No uh, and the answer is probably, right? It's like at least probably. And it's like, okay, if, if you concede on that point, then you have then this part two of that is if, if you agree, then where is that type of consolidation, pullback, scary red candle, etc., most likely to form? And I think I think the prime candidate type of area for that is between what 50 and like in the 50s right 50 53 whatever that type of area and yeah. so then you know then you look at altcoin futures and all that kind of stuff i think that the net outcome of those things if you accept the premises is that like fresh longs are not like plus ev for my system at the very least bear in mind that can change literally on monday i'm finally getting back home to my desk on monday morning so i could just like turn up by the top and then we get our pullback i'll be sure to let you know that's what usually happens when i come when i come off of a break but i just think it's worth not taking for granted the immediate all-time high thesis even if you have an end of year all-time high thesis this can be two very different things you know and there, there's nothing worse than getting stitched up or like taken out of the market involuntarily if you're right in whatever six months but you manage to fuck it up for yourself in three months that's just like a very uh, unfavorable position to find yourself in and one i've been in enough to know that yeah i agree and um i think yeah 50 you could see a scenario right we're at 50k almost and it breaks and everybody gets euphoric and then we go to like 53 54 55 and we go back to 45 or 40 or 35 yeah yeah sure why not uh, like that's that's good and lovely pain 
I think one of the things to consider here is where has capital rotated to that could be the most punished and the most difficult to get out of once you're in that correction zone and they make me say it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think you know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, continue. I, I like the point you're making. Um, it, it, the hardest place to get out of, the easiest place to lose your position of control is being in JPEGs at that point, right? Um, and a lot of cash, if you look at OpenSea volume, if you look at average prices of collections, et cetera, a lot of cash has gone to JPEGs. And like, honestly, people, I've seen a lot of people that are like, yeah, man, I wasted my time in DeFi and now my life's changed in JPEGs. Except they're like, once again, they're rolling their profit from JPEG to JPEG and they're still gonna be illiquid in that scenario if it, if it nukes. Um, when they could be in similar scenario, if you look at it in a technical manner, in a position of control, if they wait for the opportunity to come to them. And I actually am convinced that pricing of JPEGs is pretty similar to pricing of altcoins in the long term, and that there'll be some really great deals if you just wait on the appropriate opportunity, and that there's got time to, uh, to FOMO and sell higher or whatever. But, um, you know, it was uh, Cryptopathic who made a pretty good point of like, uh, you basically can't tell when the music's going to stop. So you need to be consi consistently like selling on the way up within a collection, your portfolio as a whole, et cetera. Yeah. Like if you're not taking some off the table over time, then um, eventually you're going to get that liquidity crunch and the floors are not floors. <laughs> They're elevators down. <laughs> and, uh, it makes me happy the way the downside in Bitcoin played out, right? This is a very short interjection, but everyone was saying, oh, well, I'll just like rotate out when the uptrend stops, when we break down. And then what happened? It literally went from 60 to 30 in a straight line. You didn't get the fuck out. You probably bought the dip at 40 and then you're staring at yourself at 28 thinking what's going on, right? Yeah. So it's like this, it's this eternal myth that you can sell like, uh, sell the breakdown once the trend shifts. It's it's usually not how those things unravel, you know? Yeah, and it, it, it gets really depressing the more you think about what could occur, right? So <clears throat> let's say somebody, um, let's say they they started at 10 ETH, right? They had 10 ETH to their name and they've been rolling JPEGs and they've made life-changing amounts of money and now they have a thousand ETH. And one of the things they did with that thousand ETH was they reinvested it, of, co of course. They've stayed reinvested this whole time, didn't take it off the table. Now they're like, look, I bought a Fidenza for 400 ETH. It's 40% of my portfolio. Well, what if, and I'm not saying Fidenza, I like them a lot. I'm not saying it. Look, let's say that 400 ETH Fidenza, now the most they could sell it for is like 40 ETH um, by the end of the year. And it's down 90% in terms of, and there's no one to buy them. No one wants to buy these things yet. And now it's like the end of the year. Oh, by the way, uh, the year ended. You just realized a thousand ETH worth of gains, but you fully reinvested it. And um, now you owe taxes on 990 ETH that you rolled. And uh, that's gonna cost you 400, you know, previous ETH price. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was, December 31st. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then ETH corrected, and also uh, your JPEGs are illiquid, and um, you actually are broke. Um, dude, this is going to happen. This is absolutely going to happen. Um, people are going to go from making millions of dollars to being destitute or uh, tax evaders, one of the two. Uh, and that really makes me sad. I hope it does not happen, but it's going to happen. And, I love the positive vibes, you know, uh, this took a really well, a turn for the better, this, this conversation. This gets to the point earlier. If you're in this with 5 or 10% of your portfolio, like we talked about, then that's one thing. You can cover that loss based on your other liquidity. If you are in with 100% of your portfolio, um, you cannot. And you will end up either breaking the law or breaking yourself. And that's very, very bad. <laughs> right? That is not a position of control. It's the ultimate position of weakness. And people did this. People did this. They've done it in every cycle. They will do it again. And if I were 100% in JPEGs, I've, I've encouraged some friends who like it started as 5 or 10% and then it became 100% of their portfolio, right? I've encouraged some who made life-changing money. I was like, please, I know you're happy. 
get some, get a lot out, right? Take profit, sell some every week, whatever you have to do. If you have to dump it on the floor, if you have, whatever you have to do, get it out over time so that you have a tolerable exposure towards the end of the year. Because my personal opinion is the JPEG bear market will be on by the end of the year, certainly into next year, into tax time, because this is going to hit a lot of people. And people made their money this time, not in not in DeFi. The average person did not make their money in DeFi. They did not make their money in altcoins. They did not make their money in Bitcoin. They made their money in JPEGs. And the money currently is fake because if they're not liquid, they're not rich, <laughs> you know. Um, and and what would be the catalyst for a serious? And what would kind of have to be pres presumably well, it can't be. This is what I'm getting at, right? So, what would be the catalyst for a correction in JPEGs? Because they seem to be correlated with the market more broadly, right? So, it, it's much harder to. Th I mean, it doesn't have to be, but it's definitely harder to think of a world where ETH, like everything's bullish, trending up, etc. And then even the high end pieces, the fudenzas, I'm going to call them now after your <laughs> after your commentary, <laughs> like all idea. of those pieces. <laughs> I know it's great. Uh, all of those pieces start nuking, etc. Like. In my mind, that's much more likely to happen if the rest of the market eats like eats shit, and then JPEGs eat shit much harder, which is understandable. That kind of beta relationship. But you know, if, if you're bullish the majors, what catalyzes a like non-trivial JPEG bear market? How, what does kind of the, everything else look like if your JPEG thesis is correct? Um, so in the up only market you're a little safer because you'll probably be like up in USD gang. Um, but there could still be a massive liquidity crunch as people rush to get Ethereum and price exploration. Uh, so right. kind of the negative correlations that we used to see with Bitcoin and altcoins, very similar concepts. Now, the likelihood in that scenario is the same thing that happened in January 2018, that the final push was a turbo bull market for altcoins in USD, where like everyone had that potential for liquidity but guess what they actually thought they thought it's new paradigm up only and they're like not taking profit and then it dies that's if you're lucky right everything's up but the negative correlation occurs final pump you should be selling everything but like it only works if only a few people do that <laughs> um, if, <laughs> if everybody recognizes it for what it is then you're screwed so the easier way to do it is to take profit so that you have a limited exposure to what you're comfortable with in those things and you can cover your taxes and everything else. I know that's boring. People make fun of me all the time for talking about taxes, but guess what? Yeah, I get made fun of as well. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. like part of the thing. Um, and like I'm getting called in a chat right now, Ledger Small Brain, and like, good luck, dude. Like, good good luck in January if you're fully exposed to that stuff. And I'm like, I'm, I just bought a bunch of them. Like, I spent... A bunch, <laughs> a bunch. I put it publicly on. And you're trying to get me to buy them. This is how you start um, the call. You're like, the premise of this call is to get you to buy JPEGs. Literally an hour later, you're like, look, JPEGs <laughs> are entering a massive bear market. You're fucked. It's like, what are you trying to do to me here? No, they, I think they could. I think I think some things could do really well. I think the majority are probably dumb, but like I think some could still do really well. It just you need to have a limited risk exposure that's tolerable for this scenario. Um, I bought the stuff that I bought because I like it and I think that it can go up and it can be both an enjoyable exercise and also a uh, profitable one. And I, I, but I also recognize that I did not buy a Fidenza for two ETH. I would be looking to try to be a buyer for 200. I'm not rich enough to do that because right. that would put me in that all in scenario that I'm unwilling to do. So I can buy a poor man Fidenza, uh, which is like the Ecumenopolis and um, yeah, sure. Maybe I spent 20 ETH on it, but you know, I, I've, I'm at a point where I can afford to take that L. Um, so like mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 people should be careful. I'm not trying to call to the doom of NFTs at all, but if it's, if it's what, this ledger shift, who's going to tell you this won't end well, like every couple of weeks, very cryptically. <laughs> and every time the floor price on like punks goes down, you'll be the bottom indicator because you'll have this like pre-prepared tweet on why punks are going to zero. <laughs> this is your future I don't, knowledge I don't if think, you're ready. I don't think they're going to zero. I actually think, I think punks have whatever, lended themselves. And I think that like, you, mm -hmm. you know, I think some of this stuff is incredible and I want that asymmetric upside with 5, 10, 15% of a portfolio, whatever you're able to And tolerate. even Lindy stuff gets nuked, right? You yeah. remember Bitcoin went to like 3K, <laughs> ETH went to 80 bucks. Like this, and yeah, you can have like 50, 70% corrections without the fundamentals changing. It's just part of the crazy landscape. ETH we went from, right? this is, consider a point of, of control. ETH went from to $1,400. It went from say $10, and this is all like what you could buy on Coinbase, $10, 
$1,400, $80. And what was that, cred? A year and a half? <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's something insane. like that. It's, it's, it's an absurd timeline. So now, okay, Mr. Oh, I just want nothing in life more than a punk with a pipe. Um, give yourself the right opportunity. Don't leverage yourself based on gains that you have not paid the taxes for and all that stuff that then you'll be in a liquidity crunch when the, you know, the IRS comes calling. Um, that's not a position of control. Wait, sure. wait until from a position of control, it might be higher than the prices now, but there will be a time where your favorite JPEG will come down into your position of control and you will be able to buy with confidence with a smaller percentage of your portfolio to allow you to enjoy the process and potentially have that monetary <laughs> upside rather than like FOMOing in with everything you've got because you needed that art. Um, yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to look at it. And look, even if like our Lindy super conservative orange coin and Ethereum, you know, the safe bets can go down 50, 70%. Uh, that that probably isn't going anywhere anytime soon, especially as NFT derivatives get built and fractionalization. Oh my God, that's going to definitely add some vol to the underlying yeah, assets, in my fun. opinion. So, which would be fun. Yeah, I can't get to get liquidated on those, um, but you know, you'll probably get the dips and the cascades that we're used to um, once those products become financialized. You know, so we're still very early. The fact that the infrastructure is still shitty is quite telling in itself. Yeah, uh, Paradigm, who they're brilliant, by the way, like, and they've got the biggest bags in the world. Like, they just wrote a paper on like JPEG perps or something. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, <laughs> this is yeah, CryptoPunk flaw technical analysis coming to a <laughs> shitty Twitter account near you. Um, it'll be on ours, man. It'll be us tweet about that. Oh yeah, it'll be us. That, that's what I meant. <laughs> you know, the shitty accounts. You know, hands high in the air. Um, listen, on that note. Uh, I've got a bender to get ready for, but I do have a question to ask just for some perspective, right? So when we were chatting at between 30 and 40K, right? Everyone was trying to, you know, oh, we're in a range, that's pretty obvious, blah, blah, blah. And then we were all trying to think forward, which is already a good thing, and come up with reasonable scenarios for what might happen when the range resolves, right? And one of those scenarios was obviously the kind of, well, you just roll over and die and go to 20K, 14K, whatever, prolonged bear market, uh, we're all fucked and you know that that didn't play out it looked like it was going to and then some good things happened and rich people bought bitcoin and the rest is history right uh, another scenario that most people gave some credence to or tried to prepare for is the the argument of some sort of complacency shoulder right the idea that this range would break to the upside but that upside break wouldn't be trend forming it would be some sort of lower high or just a move higher before part of a larger correction lower. Um, and the, the target area that most people had for a complacency shoulder or whatever, I think most people also were looking at a Bitcoin chart and it fell roughly, I think 40K, 50K, like that type of area, right? My question to you is, and I don't have an answer to this that's definitive, I've got like mixed opinions and so do the other peers of mine I've spoken to, but essentially what, do you think the complacency, the Bitcoin complacency shoulder case has been invalidated? Uh, and if not, why not? And if yes, kind of at what level did that stop being a tenable slash plausible idea for you? Do you kind of see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I do. Because when you and I had a podcast and I talked about my conviction that essentially we were going to go test 44 and that's where I was going to risk off, uh, you right. being a good friend were like, I remember the letter status that told me he was risking off at 44K <laughs> and instead he's buying whatever I was buying at the time. <laughs> Um, so that was, that was in my boomer TA, the 200 day moving average. I have a big yellow line, like being kind of the underside of the broad consolidation from, you know, where it did the rounding top. We broke above that and now we're in no, no man's land, right? So 44 to 54 is kind of a <laughs> IDK, LOL. <laughs> you know? JPEG lol, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, we could just consolidate in that range. If we lose it, that's like where I get scared, yada, yada. And um, I, I do think that like the Coinbase 58-ish, like that was a complacency shoulder in hindsight, you know, like the little one before we went to 30K. Um, yes. If you look at this like big, long, um, since January type of chart on Bitcoin, it's kind of hideous. 
uh, just in general, like it's relatively patternless in my opinion. Uh, but we've not reached price exploration. We've not reached an equal high. I will have more confidence as an example, if like what we showed on that 2017 ETH chart, we basically make an equal high rather than a, like a macro low, uh, lower high, like on a weekly. Uh, so if we make like a equal high, we go back to 64, 65, and then we draw down, that's going to give me high degrees of confidence to just buy the dip and we get this long consolidation. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, if we just... If we if we crap out like let's just say right here, whew, it's going to be a tough market, right? Like it's just going to be a lot harder to come in with that conviction um, at uh, forty or whatever, like wherever becomes the levels that you know TA type people like to point at and 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 try to predict. And I think the um, the seasonality and the calendar will start to play a big role in what to expect at that point. Um, so I, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Like I'm looking, can can Bit, uh, can Bitcoin get over like 57, 58, which would be to get above the prior complacency shoulder, then that would mm. be uh, the type of thing where I'm confident that this market is going to last for longer. My thesis at the end of 2020 was that essentially this was going to be a multi-year bull market, which therefore required multi-month consolidation in the middle of it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be right yet, but my predictions for the year were actually that ETH goes to 6K and Bitcoin goes to like 66K or something like that. I can't. Um, I said that at a podcast on December 31st, and like I actually still see that as a potential scenario, right? Bitcoin equal high, nice. Ethereum price exploration to the uh, 6K range, and like then we were done for the year basically. So if if we consolidate all year in Bitcoin. Imagine what can happen in, in altcoin price exploration, all that. Like, and there's this absurdity to it. And then, you know, Bitcoin dominance. What if Bitcoin dominance takes over in January? Like, that would be a really interesting play. Almost the inverse of what happened last year. Last year, we had DeFi summer, September through December, Bitcoin rampaged from 10K to 30K, you know, peaked at 42. Um, but the rotation to altcoins began literally January 1st. And I think a really interesting setup would be what if Bitcoin dominance bottomed at the same time this year, and like there's this mm -hmm. massive rotation to Bitcoin after a equal high consolidation from now until the rest of the year. So Bitcoin doesn't make a new high all year, and there's consolidation between 45 and 60K, and then it's like a freaking lid ready to blow as all this money is just ready to flow from ETH at 6k or whatever from AVAX and Solana and all this stuff that hypermooned and it just like slams Bitcoin and Bitcoin spends the beginning of 2022 just rampaging from 60k to like 200k like that I like that's a dream scenario right <laughs> The dream scenario, you'll, you always notice when you're talking to like people who are really bullish, because they'll just say that the worst Bitcoin can do is consolidate. <laughs> and that, that was a lot of like the, the, a big narrative when we were literally topping. It's like, oh, yeah, Bitcoin's going to consolidate and then dominate, dominance rotates and then number go up. And of course, what happened was Bitcoin consolidated, ETH doubled, BSC became a thing and then everyone died. So a lot of the time, like Bitcoin consolidation, uh, depending on but what you, it's a product of, can be quite like but you, we did, you know, we scary. Needed, we needed the pain, right? And we <laughs> we and we achieved it. So like, if it just was that roundy top, and it's like, oh yeah, now we're just complacent at fifty k, and this is so cool. Like you know, we just love our bitcoins at fifty k. Oh, it, it took that sub thirty k, like I don't <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, five wicks, and then the one that was the worst, like the daily close back to the yearly open under the whole range that mattered, the round numbers at thirty k, and that was the bottom, right? But there was classic three months of pain as it like just ground down in there, you know, like. There, there, enough pain was established to be able to continue upwards. Um, and, and the pain is more important than like the level. Uh, you look back at like, where did bear markets end? So many people were like, well, yeah, Bitcoin's going back to 1500. It bottomed at 3100 because there was enough pain in that bear market down 85%. And like it bottomed where people were willing to buy coins. This time that was 30K. And so, yeah, like, Sure, we can call, like it's still bullish consolidation if you look at it on this like longer term. <laughs> if you see that enough, everything yeah. is bullish consolidation, right? So we did not go back to the all time high of twenty k like that. 
all yeah. of us, all of us were pointing at like, yes, we must go there. We must go there. We had this like mini bear market in the middle of what could set up to be a multi-year bull market. And like, I want to be here for that opportunity. I will not win if I'm wrong. <laughs> like, right. You know, my, I might be sitting on my all time high portfolio value right this moment because I'm wrong in that thesis. But I think the potential for that thesis is high enough that the macroeconomic landscape is not going to change globally in the next like six to eight months where this could occur. Therefore, I want to be here for that potential ride because logically mm -hmm. all of that makes sense to me, right? Like there, there's the logical potential for JPEG, bear market, ETH price exploration, Bitcoin consolidation, rotation to Bitcoin, Bitcoin king, Udi euphoric, uh, and then we <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the way I, I, I conceptualize, I mean, for, for people like, you know, for normies or whatever, I, I, I never tell or advise friends, family, whatever. I mean, I don't do that anyway, but if, if the question comes up, like getting rid of your entire crypto exposure, unless you're a experienced market participant, and even then, it's like probably one of the worst decisions you can make on average. Yes. Because like as a trader, I've got no qualms, you know, I get out and then it dildos and my thesis is in, invalidated and I buy that back without blinking. I'm fine with that. Most people aren't, right? They'll exit thinking, yeah. well, I'll buy back lower, and then it goes against them. They're like, oh, now I'm going to start writing about Tether, right? That's usually the way it goes. Yeah. Um, and the second point, more broadly, and this has been really made obvious with what happened with JPEGs, but crypto offers so many fucking good longs every single like day, week, month, depending on your time frame. So there's really no reason to take shitty ones. You know, like when all the when all the stuff is pointing towards this being like an unattractive pump, like you don't have an invalidation, the risk reward isn't clear, the you know the the futures market looks really frothy, etc. Like depending on your time frame, there's almost always a better trade or a non-shit trade that's available in crypto. Um, and really, as we as you and I know from talking to all the giga brains that we do, Alameda, CMS, etc., a lot of the time it's really like three, four punts a year that make up a disproportionate amount of your PL and everything else kind of just ends up being noise break even. Uh, in, in comparison. So there's really no rush for this kind of stuff and either. I, I, made, I made the mistake of that, whereas like I went into cash, like 80, 90% cash, three, four, I don't know, five times <laughs> between June and uh, the bottom in late July. And at one point, I actually told some family members, I was like, look, this is either the Pico bottom <laughs> or like we're going, uh, <laughs> or we're going back to like, 14 to 20 K. Can you tolerate that? That's up to you. But if you cannot tolerate that, you could do something like sell half and average back in over time. Um, sure. Yeah. And the confirmation to have bought there was not to just buy the Pico bottom and be a genius on Twitter. It was to buy like 34 K when the trend very clearly broke with like three daily candles that were quite different from the rest. And then off we went. And, um, in the long scheme of things, what did you lose by being out for like 3K on Bitcoin? Very little, right? 10%. And yet... My ego, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I completely agree with you. I think you actually and Don both are very good at this. I'm not as good. Like I'm good at having conviction um, at times, but like that doesn't necessarily mean like it's usually when you go from bullish to more bullish. If we're looking for a scenario <laughs> where it's like, how do I come in, be willing to be on the sidelines and wait for this like perfect spot? Um, I'm less good at that to like be so patient that as you want to like do all the things you shouldn't do, um, you just don't. And then you wait for when it's obvious y'all are. I mean, I was patient, but I was in agony just to be clear. Right. Like yeah. I got out on Coinbase IPO day, felt like a fucking legend, but then I watched <laughs> ETH double while I was in USDC and I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this is like actually disgusting. And the thing is I was getting ETH long signals as well at like whatever the pre breakout levels, but my system didn't let me take it because Bitcoin still looked like shit and it told me to stay in cash. So that was quite agonizing. Then I just got over it. And then of course the crash came and that, you know that's probably yeah i think straight up the best trade of my life in that two-day period or whatever it was but it's not like easy like oh well now i wait for the crash it's like no no, i'm watching ethereum double all my friends are rich from DeFi, and i'm there like woo market's over you know it's, it's kind of like not as easy as it sounds yeah it's uh I, it was 
that was a very difficult situation and very much the type of thing that could mark a market top, right? ETH continuing. Oh yeah, it was on. super tricky. Yeah, ETH continuing on while Bitcoin bonds, and that's why I think we probably completed this like mini bear market. And now, I think that's why I think the most likely scenario is we're going to have this big scare. Everybody will call it over, but actually, we already had the maximum pain. So then we'll have the like wash out the t like the the too large of hype type of stuff, right? Like wash out yeah. the pe the weak people, the poorly positioned people etc with the like scare that we get inevitably and then that's when you set yourself up for like really great multiples probably in majors but also probably in the same stuff that's already trended you know it's a lot like solana I like the idea of that. solana goes to 200 then goes back down to 100 and then goes to 500 <laughs> <laughs> i can see that i mean honestly that would be ideal scenario being mega selfish for me that'd be great given I just come back from my break <laughs> and get, get a scary looking pullback and finally fork the rest of it into the market for some sort of higher low. That would be fun. I'm going to remind God knows. somebody, please send me this because I've recorded it. Uh, so somebody please send me this when that time comes so that I remember. Uh, yes. And, and Once we see some scary, buy. scary candles, make sure both of us are lifting offers. Ledger, yeah. this is fun, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Awesome. And I'm sure we should do a mix up session, get some, you know, get some of our friends up there next time and riff. But I think this is actually very informative, hopefully. I mean, I, it was it was for me, so hopefully for the audience as well. Um, that's all I've got. And I'll chat to you in a bit. And to everyone listening, uh, have an awesome weekend. Bye bye.